Welcome to another episode of the Happy Even After podcast. I am your host, Renee Bauer, and I am here today with a legend. My guest is Rebecca Zung, and she is a divorce attorney, podcast host, best-selling author, and an expert on narcissistic personalities. She has a wildly popular YouTube channel that has over 3 million downloads, and she's been featured in Forbes, Time, Newsweek, Huffington Post, and the list goes on and on. And she has carved out an expertise and is pretty much a narcissist ninja. I think that that's an appropriate description. So welcome, Rebecca. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. So the word narcissist is kind of like a hot topic, a hot button. And I know I have so many clients who will come to me and they'll be like, well, my, my spouse is a narcissist. And so what is a narcissist and what is a narcissist not? So, you know, a lot of people say, oh, if that person just says uh, anything that appears to be uh, nice about themselves, then they must be a narcissist. Um, but that's not how it is. I mean, we all, as human beings, want to feel seen, heard, and know that we matter. And that's just part of being the human experience. If you're, homo, if you're a homo sapien walking around on the planet, you want that. And so that doesn't make you a narcissist. Um, you know, so it's kind of like a continuum. What really makes you a narcissist is when you're all the way at the end of the continuum and it becomes like a pathological thing where you literally have no sense of internal value. And so you have to get all of your value from the external and, and coupled with the fact that you have no sense of care, love, or compassion or empathy for another human being. You literally cannot feel that for another human being. That's so how, a narcissist. So how does someone identify what one is? Because I'm guessing that you have a married couple and one spouse isn't coming home and is like, guess what, honey? My therapist said I was a narcissist today. You know, that's something that's kind of under wraps and no one's going to label themselves that way, certainly, or talk about it. Um, so how do you really identify that you're dealing with a true narcissist or just an asshole? Yeah. So, I mean, what I say to people is it doesn't really matter because if your experience is that that person is, whether it's a true narcissist who's actually diagnosed on this DSM, you know, spectrum or whatever, or the person is just ridiculously difficult and making your life a living hell, doesn't really matter. You know, I mean, because obviously you have to deal with them the same and most narcissists aren't actually diagnosed. But um, the true narcissistic personality has a, a very specific uh, 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 um, methodology that they go through as far as their relationships. So it's, it's, it's love bombing. That's what they start off with. They come on really strong. They seem really charismatic, very perfect. They're extremely good at reading people. Um, they're master manipulators. They've spent way more than 10,000 hours. It's like their entire lives are spent manipulating. And so they're very good at reading exactly what would be a perfect person for you. And they come on really, really strong. And um, you know, whether it's a romantic relationship or a business relationship or whatever, it's this is what I can do for you. Here's why you're so perfect for me. Here's why we're so perfect for each other. And everything just seems like a whirlwind. And and they're moving the relationship along really quickly. You know, if it's in business, we should be doing this together right away. You just met, but here's what we should be doing. You know, if it's romantic, move in together. I love you on the second day, blah, blah, blah. And then once you're under that little web of control, then the devaluing starts. And, and that's when you start to see these little things that aren't adding up. Lies that, are, that you're kind of uncovering and they always have some good explanation for it. Um, or um, just, you know, you, you start to feel them devaluing you for some reason, like a little cut down here and there. Um, you know, I, I, somebody told me that, um, you know, 
a few months in that the person was like, oh, you, you know, you better watch what you eat, you know, you're with your eating habits, you're, you're going to start, you know, packing on the pounds, you're already starting to look thick in the middle, you know, and, and, and it's like, oh, but the person just told me that I was the most beautiful person they'd ever seen, you know, like, and it's like, it, it, it gets really confusing. And then they love bomb to value, love bomb to value, love bomb to value. And then the discard phase is the last phase of a relationship with a narcissist. And during that phase is when you see the birth of the smear campaign and, and you see them triangulate and line up their flying monkeys. And um, they've got, um, and, and you know, they're gaslighting you the whole time. Um, it, it's just this toxic stew of a relationship and you're constantly seeing these red flags. Um, but because of the love bomb and devaluing, they go back and forth. It actually changes your neuronal patterns and you start to become trauma bonded to these people. So it, it really is hard to escape these relationships. How does someone walk away from someone like that? Well, it's not easy. I mean, the first step is um, really getting an education and understanding that this is what it is that you're dealing with. And, you know, understanding, hey, there is a pattern to their relationship. Yes, all they're looking for is narcissistic supply. So, you know, supply is anything that feeds their ego. And it can be compliments and prestige and money, but more often than not, than not they get supply from devaluing people, debasing people, controlling vindictive behavior, or using the court system as a sword, uh, you know, dragging out cases, flying monkeys, gaslighting, all that stuff feeds their ego. They have an endless need for narcissistic supply. So understanding that, that, that that's what's going on is really the first step is what I've found for people like you know, I've had so many people say that they've watched my videos like over and over and over again, or they've listened to them for like a week straight. Like they've been binge watched my entire channel because they, they, they're now starting to realize, oh my God, it's not me because the narcissist wants you to think that it is you, that there's something wrong with you. Um, and so th I think really that's the first step in the process is watching videos, reading books, listening to the podcasts, learning about narcissism and understanding it is not you. And then once you can understand that, um, you right away, you, uh, you start to feel stronger. Um, and then you can start to develop a plan. And, and that's what my resources do is give people the, the exact plan that they need to actually start to get ready and, and, and negotiate with these people and get out of the relationships. And so that brings me to kind of the million dollar question. Can you negotiate with the narcissist or are you destined to end up in an expensive, costly, really long trial? Um, you are destined into a, a, a long case that's very costly unless you create a super strong strategy and develop invincible leverage. And that's what my slave program teaches people. It starts, stands for strategy, leverage, anticipate what the narcissist is going to do and focus on your case. So that's what slay stands for. Um, and, and unless you do that, you are definitely destined for, for that. Um, because as I said, they get supply from that. So, but you absolutely a hundred percent can negotiate with a narcissist. It's actually very easy once you create the leverage that you need, because they're the not so secret secret is that they're actually the most scared little creatures on the planet. They just don't want you to think that. They don't want you to know that. And so they do everything that they do to try to make them, you know, look very intimidating. And most of the time people believe them. But if you um, do the work and create the strategy and the leverage, you absolutely can get them to settle. It's all tied up in threatening a source of supply that means more to them to keep than the supply that they get from jerking you around. What kind of leverage are you talking about? Can you give us an example? Yeah. 
So leverage is anything that's going to threaten their supply source. So um, it could be uh, exposing them in court for being a liar. Mm -hmm. It could be exposing them in court for being a uh, bad parent. Um, exposing, you know, exposing them in front of people that they respect, which is usually judges and other lawyers. Um, it could be exposing them to their uh, coworkers or employees or employers. Um, it, it could be, um, you know, putting people on witness lists that they don't want to have, you know, that, that they don't want them to know what's going on with them. Um, it could be uh, letting the world know that they have a sexually transmitted disease. Uh, that, you know, I had that a situation where I had the, the husband was a doctor and well known and well respected in the community. And um, he, got, he contracted herpes and gave it to the wife. And so we were going to add a civil battery claim to his peti the petition uh, for uh, you know, contracting herpes and, but we didn't do that. We, we threatened to do that. We said, if you don't settle, um, then this is what we're going to have to do. And everybody in the whole community is going to know that you have herpes. So, I would, you know, I would, I would imagine it's really hard for the other spouse who has been the victim of this type of behavior to really find the strength to do some of the strategies that you talked about because they're not aggressive and they're used to sort of shrinking back. So what should they be looking for in terms of a legal team in order to really stand up to someone like this? Because I do think that it's they need extra support more than someone who's divorcing and doesn't have this situation that they're dealing with. Yeah. So they need a, a strong lawyer for sure, but 99.9% .9 of lawyers don't understand narcissism. So, you know, that's why they need, you know, like my slay program coupled with a strong lawyer. And in the program, I do give questions on vetting lawyers for dealing with narcissism and for sure, even if your lawyer has never even heard of the word narcissist before, you definitely want somebody who's going to be willing to believe you, listen to you, not victimize you over and over again by saying, oh, it doesn't really matter, or um, you know, you're overreacting, or you're, you're blowing things out of proportion. You don't need somebody who's not going to believe you. You need somebody who's going to definitely have, have your back, but also um, you know, be willing to go on the offensive and you yourself who, you know, as the victim of a narcissist, it's really hard. You feel like you're putting on clothes that don't fit you because you're like, so not used to that. But most of you who are out there who've been victims of narcissists, you'll come into my office and you'll say, um, I just want what's fair. I don't want anything more than what's fair. I'm not willing. I don't care about his... 401k or blah, blah, blah. And they'll say things like that. I just want to get out of this. Or mothers, especially, will say, I'll, I'm willing to give up child support. I'll just, I just want my kids. And, and it's like, well, how are you supposed to live without child support? So what I say to people is do not give away your leverage too early um, and, and be willing to go on the offensive because they're going to, I mean, they, they have a plan. Their plan is to take you down. Their plan is to win at all costs. They, and their narcissists are street fighters. They fight dirty. Mm -hmm. You know, they do the equivalent in court and in, in, in litigation. They do the equivalent of kick you in the balls and pull your hair and bite and all that stuff. I mean, it's the equivalent of that. And so you have to be willing to go on the offensive right out of the gate. And get right out of the gate, subpoenas, request to produce, motion for for temporary support, blah, 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 right out of the gate, because you want to be on the offensive. Otherwise you feel like you're, compl you're, you're playing defense the whole time. So would you re or, um, try to dissuade someone from mediating with a narcissist? No, I definitely wouldn't. I definitely think you do need to mediate with a narcissist, but you need to, you can't mediate too early You've got to have your strategy and your leverage all in place so that when you go to mediation, that's when you whip out everything that you've put together and you go, 
here's what it's going to look like for you if you don't settle today. Um, and, and, and that's when they're going to be willing to settle, but not before. So how does someone possibly co-parent with someone like this? Because that relationship, while they, the divorce might be over and the finances are done, but if they have to parent with them, that person is in their life for a really long time. So how do they continue to have a civil co-parenting relationship with someone who's tried so hard to knock them down? Yeah, I always say that co-anything with a narcissist is kind of like, <laughs> you know, um, it throws you off because it's just definitely not true and it will never happen. Um, you can't really co-parent with a narcissist. Um, so I do recommend if you're dealing with a true narcissist, especially a malignant narcissist or somebody who's overly, overly difficult, um, to uh, enter into what I call a parallel parenting plan, which is, um, or I don't call it that, but it's, it's called that in the system, which is basically you know, you really don't interact with each other at all or minimally. And then I definitely recommend that the parenting plan is as specific as possible, like down to the minutia of details, literally who's driving to, you know, to pick up the kids or to drop the kids off. Where is the drop off going to take place? If it's at school and they don't have school, where is it going to be exactly what time? And the same thing for every single birthday and every single holiday um, and, and even put in there like what happens if somebody needs to switch weekends, then what's going to happen. Um, and then um, I do recommend that you have um, an app of some sort, a co-parenting app and use that um, because that can be monitored. It can be looked at. You can give access to lawyers. You can print them out. They become great trial exhibits. Um, and so there's several out there. Um, our Family Wizard is probably the most popular one, but there are a ton of others out there nowadays. Um, and um, it doesn't really matter just as long as you pick a co-parenting app of some sort. Um, I do recommend that. Um, and, you know, maybe even have something in place that says, you know, if you can't agree, if there is an issue um, that, you know, that there's a parenting coordinator that you would work with to try to interpret the agreement, just to try to save fees. Because otherwise you're going to be like back in court every other day with these people. Now you have something on, I think it was one of your YouTube videos that I thought was really helpful. And it was actual phrases that someone can use when communicating with the narcissist. So can you share some of those? Because I think that that's such a, I mean, that's something so concrete that someone can take right now and kind of tuck into their pocket and pull out when they need them. Yeah. So most of the phrases are going to be, uh, um, in the vein of like, don't personalize these things. Don't take it personally when they say things to you and don't um, get that emotional, you know? So if somebody calls you a, a crappy mom or a deadbeat dad or something like that, and you're there like, you know, you just pick the kids up from baseball and you're feeding them dinner and you're like, I'm, I'm a negligent mom or, you know, like what the hell? And so uh, your, your, your first reaction is to like defend yourself or something. So what I recommend in situations like that is, you know, just say something like, I understand that that's what you think, or I understand that's how you feel and you're, you're entitled to how you feel. Um, something like that, you know, like where you're just not personalizing it, you, you know, um, another one would be like if they send you a super long email that is accusing you of all kinds of things that are just not true, like that you were drunk last week when you picked up the kids or whatever. Um, you just write back. and But then there's like one kernel in there of something that you do need to respond to, like what time should we pick up the kids on Wednesday or something. Then you just write back and you say, uh, I am in receipt of your email. Uh, I deny your allegations and you can pick up Johnny at three o'clock on Wednesday. And that way you've, you've acknowledged receipt, you've denied the allegations and you've responded to the part that you needed to respond to. 
you don't feel like you need to respond to every single thing and defend yourself because now you're down in the mud, you're engaged in it. And that's what they want. They want you to be down in the mud with them and engaged because they get narcissistic supply from that. So that's another one. Another one is um, what we call narcissistic fluffing, which is where you kind of uh, do what we call like an ethical trade or something. Um, you, 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 you just say, you know, let's say you want them to help, I don't know, with basketball practice or something with the kids. And you say, oh, can you take Johnny to basketball practice? You're so much better at playing and coaching the game than I am. He'll get so much more out of it if you take him, um, you know, something like that, because they need that narcissistic mm. fluffing of their ego. It's like you're fluffing up a pillow or something. And most people are like, oh, I don't want to have to say that. I can't stand them. I hate them. I hate everything about them. Well, you're not going to do this unless you need to. You only do this to get something you want out of the deal. So um, that's another one. So you're manipulating the manipulator. So you're. I, I call it ethically manipulating the manipulator. <laughs> Uh, that's great. How did you get, how did you get so in, um, um, how did you get to be an expert in this? Like why this part of this one little corner of the practice, like why did you become so passionate about it? Because I don't, I, honestly, I don't know of anyone out there who does more or knows more or speaks more in this space. And it's so valuable for someone who's going through this. And you're right because so many lawyers just don't get it. And you're not going to, unless you're in that space and kind of working with those people every day. So what's your story? Well, obviously, I, I mean, I've been a divorce lawyer for over 20 years. And so I, I have obviously dealt with a lot of narcissists in my practice, either as clients or on the other side or opposing counsel. Um, but um, I kind of noticed that um, it, for many, many years, it used to be that, that, that I had this kind of running joke that all the wives said that their husbands were controlling and all of the husbands said that their wives were crazy. Um, and I used to joke that I was gonna write a book called, you know, my, my wife is crazy, my husband is controlling um, because that's what they all used to say. But in the last several years, it's just been that they've all become narcissists um, regardless. And that's like this word that people are using all the time. And I've also noticed that a lot of my cases are becoming much more, more and more litigated, more difficult to settle. And um, so there was all of that. And I had already written a book on divorce back in 2013. And I'd already been like doing a lot of press and, and media around that. Um, but then I just decided to write a book on negotiation last year because I had done a lot of speaking on negotiation in general, just any kind of negotiation. So I wrote that book and, and Robert Shapiro actually offered to write the foreword. And so there was like a lot of great things that happened with that book. And my plan was actually just to talk about negotiation in general and develop online uh, programs on negotiation. But then um, I started, I did a video called How to Negotiate with a Narcissist like a year ago or something. And I noticed that that video was like getting a lot of views on my channel. And I wasn't really even doing much with YouTube at all. Like literally, I would just throw something on there every once in a while and I really wasn't paying attention to it. But I thought, you know, let me, let me do a couple more videos on that. And then I started reading and learning a lot about narcissism. And in doing that, I realized that I actually had had two narcissists that I had to deal with. And in, in last, I just really toward the end of last year was when I was trying to uh, finally ex, uh, extricating myself from these particular situations, not in a, a romantic sense, but in a, a one was in my uh, family, an extended family member, and one was like in a business setting. And um, I realized that both of these people were covert passive aggressive narcissists. Um, I actually read the book, Covert Passive Aggressive Narcissist, and um, was like, oh my God, I'm actually a victim of narcissists. 
And I just became way, way more passionate about it then because I could speak to it from the heart. So, yeah. And you have, uh, you have two books out, right? And you have multiple courses and a masterclass in your YouTube channel. Where can someone find all of that information and how can someone uh, work with you? Uh, so everything is on my website, which is RebeccaZung.com, R-E-B-E-C-C-A-Z-U-N-G. I do have a free giveaway for your listeners. They can get my free Crush My Negotiation prep worksheet, and they can just get that at WinMyNegotiation.com. And as of today, the recording of this, um, it's been downloaded by um, over 30,000 people. Uh, um, so winmynegotiation.com, get your free crush my negotiation worksheet. And so if someone has a narcissist in their life, they absolutely need your slay course. And that's a great starting point before anything else happens. They do. Mm -hmm. get, yeah, and, and they can learn more about that. It's actually all on my website. And also, um, I encourage people to subscribe to my YouTube channel because there's so much free content there. Thank you so much, Rebecca. This was so interesting. I definitely learned a few things myself. So thank you for spending this time with us. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure.